Testament, I mean fulfilled prophecies from the Old Testament. This guy was an expert in Old Testament law. His first question was his best. And in fact, I think it was the best question. I think it remains today to be the most important question that anyone can ever ask. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Two things live forever. The Word of God and the souls of man. This is an important question. How do I live forever in the presence of God? That was the question the lawyer was asking the teacher. And it's the right question. He comes to Jesus as the source for his answer. So he's asking Jesus for the answer to this question. So what's he doing here? He's asking the right person. He's got the right question. He's got the source for the correct answer. This guy's getting off to a great start. Then the teacher, Jesus, tests the lawyer. Also a, um, an occurrence, a, a regular occurrence, is when Jesus would be tested by Pharisees, Sadducees, Lawyers, scribes, by religious leaders or priests. Jesus would often reply with a question. And so that's what he's doing here. So in verse 26, after he's asked by this lawyer, How shall I inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus asked him a question. He says, What is written in the law? How do you read it? How do you understand what you read in the law. Now, here's a lawyer, and Jesus is asking him about Old Testament law. This is his area of expertise. So if, if you were a cattleman and somebody asked you about cattle, you know, it'd be a good idea to know what you're talking about. Right? If, if, um, if you were a driver and someone asked you about a truck, you know, like a truck driver, well, you know, you, you would probably know the answer. So here's a lawyer. He should know what the law says. And Jesus asked him, okay, well, what does the law say? You've asked me the question, what does the law say? And how do you understand that law? Or what is the meaning of that law? I want to point this out to you. This, I think this is fascinating. This guy really was smart or educated uh, he really did know the law. He really was an expert uh, as a, a lawyer. And so off the cuff, when Jesus asked him this question, he puts two commandments from the Old Testament law together into one with his response. He puts Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 together with Leviticus 19 and 18 as one answer to, to uh, Jesus' question. Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He combines that with Leviticus 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself Jesus agrees Jesus says right you have answered correctly do this and you will live so here's a guy that asked the right question he asked the right person and then when he is tested he gives the correct answer to the master to Jesus the teacher. This guy's on a great, he's on a roll, he's on a good start here. And Jesus replies, do this and live. Now don't you find this fascinating? Instead of Jesus answering his question, his first initial good question, how will a man live in eternal life? Instead of him answering that question by saying, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, no man comes to the Father except by me, which we see him actually saying 
in John 14, 6, different time, different place. Instead of him giving him the direct answer to his question, instead he says, go and do what you already know to do. Go and do what you already know to do. Alright? So the guy is on a roll. He's doing good. But he's not satisfied with that. We see in verse 29 that he wasn't satisfied because he had a motive. Verse 29. But he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? I want you to look at me for just a moment. It is part of the human condition that you and I would default to want to use the Bible, Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament to justify our own actions, even our own motives, even our own thinking. And if, if you and I think that we're, if, if you think that you're immune to that, if I think that I'm immune to that, we are fooling ourselves. The Bible says so. That if any man thinks that he doesn't sin, the truth is not in him. He is a liar. So, the lawyer was doing what was common to man right there. But he was maintaining his position of being an expert in the law. And he asked this question. So who is my neighbor? Can I go backward with you for just a moment? Remember what he had done in answering the, the question? He had combined these two passages together. Let's look at this one in Leviticus 19. Here we go. You shall love the, your neighbor as yourself, but what else is there? You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. I want you to think about that for just a minute. The sons of your own people. See, here's a, a lawyer very familiar with the Old Testament. In fact, an expert in it. And he was all about taking care of Abraham's children. Taking care of the Jewish people. He would look at, at this verse in Leviticus 19.18 and he would say, okay, this verse would exempt me. It would exempt me from taking care of anybody outside of the Jewish nation. It would limit my responsibility. He might too be mindful of Psalm 139. There's a verse in there where it, it teaches that, um, you know, love your... It's, it's that one verse where you are to uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And so, you know, he would, he would say, okay, well, if they're enemies of God, then they're my enemies. And so he would justify to himself that... It was okay for him to hate some people if they weren't God's chosen people. If they weren't Jewish people. Now Christian, we have to be very, very careful. We have to be more than careful. We have to be mindful. We have to be purposeful. That when we go out into this world, we don't see people as being anything less than someone who is created in the image of God. We must not elevate ourselves to say, well, I'm, I'm saved, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I've got this thing figured out. I go to Sunday school or I go to church or whatever it is that you might do. I'm a member of a church. No, this guy had a, a resume too, this lawyer. He had all this that he could go back on. But Jesus here, instead of telling him that he was the Messiah, that he was the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus asked him this, this question. How do you, you know, how, how do you interpret it? And the man says, well, okay, that's good, but who is my neighbor? 
And before Jesus gives him the answer to the second question, he tells him this parable. A parable is a story. It's something that comes out of fiction. This is a story that Jesus made up. No, notice there's no proper names here. Okay? So, Jesus is telling him a story to illustrate a point. The question here is, the man saying, okay, well, who is my neighbor? He's trying to do what? He's trying to justify himself. He's trying to prove to Jesus and to anybody there that he was justified, that he was doing right, that he was, in fact, on his way to heaven. So Jesus tells the story about a man who fell among robbers. The man was a traveler going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. A difference in elevation of about 3,000 feet. To put that into perspective, if you go to the highest point of Blue Mountain to, the, to our south, and you come down in elevation to the Wilburton Airport, you're going to descend an elevation of about 1,100 feet. The difference between the two. So this would be three times that distance. It's a pretty good ways down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And it's a pretty long ways. It was 17 miles. If you measure the distance from where you are right now to Hartshorn, you're going to find that's about 18 miles. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the distance from here to Hartshorn. Down 3,000 feet and out, you might say, 17, 18 miles. Along this road, it, it, there was lots of hairpin turns down this mountain. It was steep, and there were lots of rocks and crevices. Um, lots of really good places for a robber to hide. This, this road exists today. Tours. People from the United States go there and tour in a tour bus. They go down this road. Very steep on one side. Very good place, it was then. Very good place for robbers to stage a sneak attack and claim their victim. It was known in that day as the road of blood. So, this lawyer, as educated as he was, would have understood that, yeah, that road is someplace that you need to watch out for when you, when you travel. And traveling down that road, this man fell among robbers. He was stripped, half naked. He was beat up to the point that he was half dead. And he was left on the side of the road to perish. Walking also along that way was a priest. And the priest was a descendant of Aaron. Now, a, a priest would be responsible for the temple worship in Jerusalem. The temple worship in Jerusalem was the center. It was the apex. It was the biggest. It was the most important worship center place uh, in the whole world. And these were the guys that were responsible to conduct worship to God there. These were the guys that represented God. These priests were the ones who by lot would go into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, once a year. I mean, this is a, a big deal. So here's this priest who represents God. He comes across the guy that's been beat up and he walks around to the other side of the road. Avoids him. The Bible here, Jesus here in his story, says that he sees him. So it wasn't by accident. He saw him and he went to the other side of the road and kept walking. He probably had an important meeting to go to. Then comes the Levite. So the Levite comes. Now he was of the tribe of Levi. Not of Aaron. As the priest was. But he still worked with the priest to conduct temple worship. They were helpers. They were uh, like support staff. For the priest. They would make things happen there at the direction of, of the priest. So they were seen as people who were very important in light of, of God and His presence with the people through the temple and through temple worship. 
Lastly, of course, this guy avoids avoids the man with the the problem, the the weak, the beat up man, the man left for dead. Lastly, here comes the Samaritan. Samaritans were thought of as being evil, half breed traitors. Samaritans were not even allowed in the temple. They were ceremonially unclean. They were born ceremonially unclean. They would always be unclean. They could never worship in the temple. The very existence of the Samaritans were seen as evil. They were a blight on the world. They were evil all the way back to the sins of Jeroboam. They were evil because they intermarried with the Gentiles when the northern kingdom was occupied. They were evil because they tried to disrupt the rebuilding of the Jewish city and temple when they came back from captivity. They were so evil that the Jews in 128 B.C. even attacked and destroyed their temple. They were half-breed traitors. In fact, if you wanted to say something really bad about somebody... If you wanted to really insult someone, you would call them a Samaritan. So here's this Samaritan. He shows up. He pours wine on the wounds. A little oil. He bandages the, the wounds on this guy. Puts him on his own animal. Takes him to the inn. Takes care of him there. Spends the night with him and the next day speaks to the innkeeper and gives him two denarii. John MacArthur believes that at the particular or a particular inn that would have been used here, two denarii could have purchased up to 60 days. Take care of this man. Use this money. And if you spend any more, I will come back and I will repay you. And then Jesus asked his question. Remember, this story came from Jesus as he was asked by the lawyer, Who is my neighbor? If you want to inherit eternal life, go and take care of other people, including the Samaritans. So here's the, here's the lawyer. You know, I can almost imagine this lawyer as Jesus tells this story. This lawyer is saying, okay, we started with a priest, then we go to a Levite. And the next person he's going to name in this story who does something wrong, who neglects the needs of a, a needy man... The next person he's going to mention is going to be a lawyer. But he doesn't. He talks about the Samaritan. He talks about the half-breed. The one who was hated. And then he asks the lawyer the question. Of these three, which one was the neighbor to the man who fell to the robbers? He gets the answer right again. He says, I suppose the one who had mercy. I suppose the one who had mercy was the neighbor. See, Old Testament law did not only say to, to uh, uh, love your, to hate your enemies and and, and love your friends. But it also said to take care of those who are among you. In other words, those who you would cross paths with. And the examples that we see from the Old Testament are examples where God offers grace to those people who will seek Him. Even people who are sinful. Even people who are wrong. Even people like this lawyer, even people like me, even people like you, when we seek God with our heart, He offers us mercy. 
If you want to inherit eternal life, go and care for others, including Samaritans. The lawyer must then give up his religious way of thinking and embrace the truth of Jesus Christ. Here, here's why Jesus didn't tell him that he was the way, the truth, and the life. Until the lawyer is ready to see that he's a sinner who needs mercy from God, he's never going to see Jesus as the one who saves him from his sin. Now, this gets difficult for you and I. I, I suppose first and foremost, it should be stated that if you're trusting in your own works and the good things that you do or in your parents or in you know, your upbringing or whatever in your knowledge, you may have a seminary degree or whatever, if you're trusting in that, you're going to miss heaven. But if you recognize that you need Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin. And you're willing and ready to do as the song that Rita sang, if you're ready to surrender, eternal life is yours for the asking. He must have faith, not in his knowledge, but in the one who had mercy on him that day. Here's our takeaway today. For the one who believes that you are good and you will in, go to heaven because of it, the answer today is to repent and accept Jesus. There is none good. No, not one. We're all in a position of need before righteous and holy God. This morning in Andrea's Sunday school class, we learned about how our best works are as filthy rags before the Lord. For believers who are stagnant in your relationship with God, recognize that God has had mercy on you and He calls on you to demonstrate His mercy to other people. Now, some people are hard to love. Some people have values that we might personally think, boy, they're really out to lunch. Some people have religious views, religious views that are not biblical. Some people want to promote a kind of justice that does not align with Scripture. Some people are for all kinds of ungodly things. Some people promote all kinds of sins and saying those are the, the right things to do. Some people are hard to love. Here was a self-righteous lawyer who was trying to justify himself and Jesus loved him enough to tell him the truth. But now listen to this. Don't miss this. But using a story, he told him the truth in such a way as to convey that Jesus loved the lawyer. See, when we go out and we're bold and we tell people the truth of God, we tell people what the Bible says, we cannot do it with, a, with an attitude that says, I'm going to put you down and I'm going to elevate myself above you. We can't do it with an attitude that says, you don't know what you're talking about, you're an idiot. We can't do it with an attitude of, well, I know because I've been studying. I know because I've been reading. I know because I've read through the Bible in a year and I know what it says. And you're wrong. Jesus didn't do it that way. When He was confronted by scribes and Pharisees, especially in Matthew chapter 23, we see where, boy, did He ever confront them, calling them names, even whitewashed tombs. But here, we see him face to face with the guy telling him the truth in a way that he would understand, in a way that he would be convicted of his own sin, and in a way where he communicated that he cared for him, even though the guy didn't buy it. Let's all stand.
If you'd like to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting Him alone for your salvation, not your good works, not your knowledge, come see me down front. Come give your life to the Lord today as, as we sing. If you're a little bit stagnant in your relationship with the Lord, let's go and let's do. And let's do it in the name of God. Let's do it for His glory, for His purposes. Not for us, but for Him.
And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, it's good to see you guys today. We'll be uh, dismissed in prayer. I wanted to add one thing. We're going to be going through a book study on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. This is not to be confused with our walk at 6 o'clock on Wednesday night. At 7 o'clock, we're going to be going through uh, a book study on becoming a welcoming church. I think we're off to a really strong start already. But I invite you to be, be there for that. Tonight at 5 o'clock, um, how we got our Bible tonight. So uh, be here for that. Also, um, coming up on the 10th is uh, a parsonage meeting where, guys, we have an opportunity to allow foreign missionaries to stay in our parsonage. But it would take work and a team of people. Specifically, we need a lady who would believe that God would call her to do that, uh, a lady who would be detailed. So uh, everybody's welcome and encouraged to be at that meeting on the 10th of January. Any other word? Todd Forwards, you dismiss us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, so good to be in your house today, Lord. I thank you for everyone that's here, Lord. I just pray and pray that you just bless them, Lord. And Father, I just pray that you be with us, Lord, as we go out and try to live in this old world, Lord. Give us strength and guide us, Lord. We just love you and thank you for all your blessings. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.